Hey everybody, welcome back. Today, I've got a little gem for you actually. We've got um, some new speakers that have come in and we've done a bunch of measurements on these things and have worked out some upgrades. And I have to say, I'm kind of impressed with the engineering that went into these. So let's get right into it. The company is called Mono, Mono Price, and Mono Price has come out with this new line called the Monoliths. This isn't the first model that I've had in from Monoprice. Um, they originally sent in a monolith that was called a KBAS model, which was a, a woofer and a tweeter underneath it. And it measured really poorly. In fact, let's look at the frequency response on it. Yeah, it was rough. And if you moved up or down, it got even worse. And there was some a little bit of stored energy in the woofer's response and the tweeter level was just so far down that I kind of felt like there may be something wrong with it. The tweeter may just be bad. And I told the customer, look, we can't fix this. We can't do anything with it. Contact the manufacturer, see if the driver's bad, send it back, do whatever. Wasn't impressed at all. Now they've got this new line out, and the complete opposite is true. I'm actually pretty impressed with what they did on this. Um, let's first just dig into the speaker itself and look at what they did. This one is, the model is the THX 365T, and it is uh, designed for home theater. It's got nicely held on magnetic grills that sit right on it. The finish on this, whatever this is they're rolling on, it's some type of... of um, a laminate coating and it looks pretty good this one has a thx speaker on top in other words this is for your front main speakers and then this is for your height speakers kind of all built into one um, the woofer is a kind of a combination it's got like a poly cone on the surface but there's treated paper on the back it's a very heavy cone material pretty stiff um, i like the material and it's well behaved it's a heavy moving mass and a lot of times we get into a woofer this small that's that heavy. It's going to give up a lot of speed and resolution as you go into the higher frequency ranges. But in this case, not an issue because it comes with this tweeter mid pod. And the mid plays down fairly low. So this doesn't have to go up that high. So it's a trade-off. You go to a big, stiff, heavier cone. It tends to handle low frequency ranges a lot better but it tends to give up speed as you approach the upper ranges. Uh, I'll also mention too, we've got in several other models from the same company right now, we've got some of the tower versions and a center channel version using all of these same drivers and they all measure really well. Uh, the only thing I noticed with these woofers all being kind of a heavy moving mass, if you look at the spectral decay and we'll look at that in a few minutes, it holds its energy a little longer. It doesn't just immediately dissipate but it, it drops off nice, smooth, and evenly. There's no ringing, no breakup, no anything crazy going on. But you can tell it's a heavier moving mass. It doesn't drop energy fast. It carries it a little longer. It's going to give it a little more bloom into the mid-range, a little more to the base. But um, overall, not bad. Uh, binding posts on the back, they look nice. Uh, unfortunately, it's like a lot of the other budget products you see out there. It's got some steel parts on the back of it which is not good come on guys and um the crossover there's some good and bad here i mean sure they use sand cast resistors they used a lot of iron core inductors and everything and they use some big electrolytic caps in the circuit but in the tweeter and the mid-range circuits they did use some poly caps and there was one layer core inductor on the tweeter circuit so fair so it's not all bad, but not great. There's no high-end parts here, but it's not horrible. But they did a good job in the design work on this. Whoever's doing the design work on this product line has done a great job. It reminds me of a lot of the ELAC stuff that would come through. Andrew Jones did all the design work on that stuff, and it always measured really well. It always looked good. Reminds me of some of the golden air products when they come in they always measured really well sandy gross great engineer always did a great job on the design work on that so 
likewise, whoever's doing the work for this stuff, they did a great job. Let's look at the on-axis frequency response. It is smooth. It's got maybe a little bit of a smiley to it, um, a little softer right there in the middle. Nothing wrong with that. And when you drop this into a room, the room response is going to be the complete opposite of that. It's going to drop off in the top end, and it, and it may drop off in the bottom until you get down below 200 hertz, and then there's no telling what your room is going to do to the response of the speaker. It could be anything at that point, but they've got a nice, smooth response. And we did one with the grill on it as well. Let's take a look at it with the grill, and it's a little rougher in the response right there where the grill is. If we look at the horizontal off axis, we notice it drops off evenly and pretty smoothly in the off axis. It stays a little proud in that 3K Hertz region. That's not unusual, uh, but overall looks good. The vertical off axis looks great. And a lot of that has to do with this tweeter mid pod. Um, they're keeping this in phase over a wide range and the acoustic centers are really close. And by the time they cross to the lower woofers, which are above and below, it's at a low enough frequency that it's not causing a lot of issues. With the woofers this far apart, as you move up and down, it's no issue because I don't think they're planned but to maybe 800 hertz or so, maybe maybe less. So at those wavelengths, the wavelengths are longer. You don't see a big shift in phase. It's just a smaller phase rotation. So the vertical off axis looks great. So over a wide coverage region, going to have the exact same sound, so chances are the in-room response is going to look really good. Spectral decay on the whole thing looks clean. Like I said before, at the very first of the woofer's response, you can see it's taken a little longer to bleed off some of that energy. It's holding it just a little, but it's bleeding it off really cleanly. No issues in the spectral decay. Um, looking at the impedance curve, it's also fairly even. And it dips to about 3.9 ohms, I think. Um, let me see if I'm reading this right. Three point, about 3.6 ohms at about 150 hertz. The rest is a pretty easy load. All that looks great. Now, we laid this thing over and we took some measurements of this Atmos speaker on top here. And I'm not even going to take this grill off of it. It's a little coaxial speaker. And here's the measurement on it. Yeah, I measured kind of rough. It, yeah, and it measures best if you leave this stuff on it. There's a foam ring that goes around it, and you take that stuff off, and it measures even worse still. And the impedance on that is also a fairly low uh, impedance load. Be sure your receiver is set to handle those 4-ohm loads because this thing is 4-ohm load all over. So um, after we took the measurements on this thing, I looked at it, and I thought, well, this is great because I don't have to redesign anything. They did such a great job with the design work. It just needs better quality parts throughout most of the circuit. Then I look inside and I think, where's it going to go? Because the entire network is designed to just barely fit in the floor of this thing. And if you start putting big quality air core inductors on this thing, which is going to be a big improvement over these little tiny 19 and 20 gauge iron core inductors, uh, it's just not going to fit in there. So we contacted the customer said, here's a problem. I don't know that this is going to fit in there. Uh, there's just no space in this box. And um, the customer said, well, you know what? I'm not going to use this uh, Atmos firing, up firing, whatever you call it, speaker for the heights and the top. I'm not going to use it. He's going to take it out. He said he may even cut a nice piece of plexiglass or something that's clear and put over it. And then on the inside... Was there enough room in this airspace, which there's a little airspace here, to mount part of the crossover? So I took a look at it and I said, yeah, there is. There really is. You could do the tweeter and the mid crossover in that little airspace and then just run the wiring down to the tweeter mid pod. And in the floor where this was, there may be just enough space to do the woofer crossover and do it in the bottom. So if you're doing that, yeah, it'll work out. And if you've got the model for this, there's the same model without this in it already. There's probably enough airspace you could mount some of it to the side walls and you can get a higher quality crossover in there. Also, the box is a little hollow. That's uh, not very thick. Uh, it's, a, it's a real good looking curved box. I'll show you kind of how the curve looks. Uh, but it's not a very thick box. So lining it with no res is definitely going to help. So we're going to put a little package together where we're just going to replicate 
the exact crossover that they designed for this thing. No sense in redesigning the wheel. Like I said, whoever did the design work for this got an A from me. They did a great job. And we're just going get, to get in there and just upgrade some parts quality. Now, these things are built to a price point, like everything, and it's built to a really low price point. So there's no way you're going to get really high-end parts with these things to begin with. You just don't see high-end parts at these budget price points, and it is kind of at a budget price point. Um, so there's no surprise when you see this stuff in there. Could they do a lot better? Could they put high-quality parts in there? Of course they could, but it would more than double the price of the speaker, whereas you come at it later and you just buy the parts and you're looking at it from a hobbyist standpoint. You want to have some fun with this and go in and, and have some fun reworking it over the weekend and rebuild these things. You're going to be really rewarded by that. You're not going to spend near as much money as if they put that kind of money in it to begin with. So we're going to work some stuff up. We're going to recommend that at least one of these sets of binding posts is replaced with some tube connectors. Um, you could then parallel the other set to it so you could use either or. That's always fun. And this is going to be done away with. And we'll get some prices on all that and put it on the website. And I'm going to do two follow-up videos for this one. We're going to look at their center channel, which uses these same drivers and also measures pretty well. And their tower version, which measured exceptionally well. And I'm going to do a little more in-depth on those and let you know what we have available for those things. I'm guessing there's a pretty good handful of these out there for the prices that they're selling them for. It's a pretty good value, even with the budget level parts. And if you go in and do some basic upgrades or implement the little upgrade kit that we're going to come up with, these should sound really good. They should be one of those speakers that punches well above their weight class. So I will get all that on the website and look for that soon. Um, we may even have all that out before the video even releases. And again, look for those follow-ups on this stuff. Monolith, who would have thought it's Maybe it's a new company. I haven't really heard much about them, but they did really well. How about that? So see you guys in the next video.